Gila Kasla. In the Kwakula language, Gila Kasla is a welcome we give at the beginning of any speech or before starting important business. And in the same Kwakwakiwak tradition, I should introduce myself, Sarah Hunt, and tell you that my grandparents, Henry and Helen Hunt, were from Tsahis, or what's now known as Fort Rupert on the northern part of Vancouver Island. And that my grandparents on my mum's side were Jack and Betty Sahedak with roots from the Ukraine and, and England. In introducing myself to you in this way, I tell you not only who I am personally, but also um, my cultural and ceremonial rights and how I might be related to you. But in truth, this talk should begin with another name, Sheila Hunt. Sheila Hunt was a name that I saw on a banner at a march uh, for missing and murdered women in the downtown east side, among dozens of other names. I was 20 years old at the time and in my first few years of university, and I'd become interested in issues of violence a few years earlier when my cousin, Malady, had committed suicide. Malady was close to my age, and she was well-loved and well-connected to her culture, and her death left a deep impression on me. I started to think about the silence that was left in her passing. How would I know her story now that she was gone? And I started to see it as my obligation to address that silence. And so after taking some classes and reading books about violence, I found myself uh, learning about the violence that was facing women in the downtown east side. And here, women had been going missing or uh, been found dead for many years, and very little was being done by the police or other authorities to take it seriously. And community members were coming together over the years to hold marches, like this one that you see in this beautiful photo uh, by David Ball. And so it was there that I found myself standing amongst the crowd and spotted the name Sheila Hunt on that banner. And suddenly, the silence that had begun to haunt me uh, became very real as I realized that if I had a family member living and working in the downtown east side, I would probably never have heard about it. The, the stigma around sex work and the shame around violence, uh, um, poverty, uh, and drug use um, would mean that I would probably never, uh, it wouldn't be talked about amongst my family. And so that, that silence and that stigma creates further distance between myself and women like Sheila. And Sheila and Malady have stayed with me uh, over the years as I've worked on violence uh, for 15 years across the province. I've first started out in the, in the downtown east side working with youth and then worked in communities across the province uh, doing research and education. And the thing that really struck me, no matter where I was, if I was in a northern small reserve community or in the downtown east side or in a city on Vancouver Island or a small town, was I uh, heard Native youth talk about violence in very similar ways. And they told me that violence was just a part of life, that it was just happened and nobody talked about it. And so I was really um, very um, troubled, obviously, by this commonality in our communities, that uh, it didn't matter where I was, that, that this was, was still happening. And so I traveled uh, all across the province, and when I was in uh, northern BC, I learned that the violence that was happening there was very similar to what was happening in the downtown east side. A uh, dozen or so girls and women have been found dead or gone missing from along the highway between Prince George and Prince Rupert. And community members here had also been calling on the police and the public for us to start paying attention to this violence. And here they weren't facing the stigma of working in the sex trade or uh, being in an area known for drug use. They were simply living in small reserve communities that are out of sight and out of mind for most Canadians. It was only when a non-native girl, a tree planter, went missing uh, while hitchhiking into town that the media and that we started paying attention. And so I uh, continued to, continue to work on these issues for the last 15 years. Of course, we know that a lot has changed in that time. As we can see, uh, the Missing uh, Women Task Force was formed. We know that serial killer Robert Picton was locked up. And there was an inquiry to look into why the, the silence went on for so long, why the police didn't act sooner in the downtown east side. Uh, we now know as the highway, about the Highway of Tears in northern British Columbia. And the United Nations wants to look into the missing women, calling it an issue of human rights. Uh, uh, research was undertaken across BC to look at the issue of murdered and missing women. And uh, when the results were released in 2010, there were uh, almost 600 names on that list. 
So community members and family members should be relieved, right? Because we finally started paying attention. There have been court cases. <clears throat> there have been poster campaigns. Uh, there's been education that's been happening in communities. But the violence continues. Violence is still a reality uh, in the lives of First Nations youth all across this province, uh, and people of all ages. Uh, young women continue to go missing from small communities, and they continue to show up dead or to die under suspicious circumstances in cities like Toronto. And gay Native men, who we call two spirits, like Dolan Badger, continue to die without any police investigation, without any justice. And so I, I started to um, really question why we continue to turn to the justice system, to the law, for answers, when it's clearly uh, not giving us any solutions. What does justice really mean? Uh, it, some of the, the um, answers that were happening as a result of community advocacy included things like these, po these um, billboards in northern BC telling girls not to hitchhike. But what good is a billboard going to do when it's minus 20 and you have to get into town for a doctor's appointment and there's simply no way to get you there? So I became more and more troubled by these Band-Aid solutions, and in 2010, I went back to school to get my PhD. And I started to ask people questions, not just about the violence, but about the solutions, about what is happening in communities, what is having an impact on violence, what solutions are people finding um, that is, is stopping the violence more than just calling the police. And uh, I'm here today to tell you that communities are doing a lot to address violence at a local level. So they're, they're in very different ways all across the province, uh, coming together to create solutions that work for them. There is no one solution, there is no one phone number you call or one poster campaign that's solving it, but they're coming together, and in First Nations communities, they're drawing on local cultural teachings uh, to look at uh, solutions that work in their communities. Uh, these include involving local elders in the solutions, um, it involves creating local community response teams, training people to, to uh, respond to emergencies. Um, in some communities, if you call the police for help, it could take a day or two, or I've heard even a week for police to come. So you can see why these local level solutions can have much more of an impact. And a program that uh, really stands out for me is the Moose Hide Campaign, which is started by Paula Cert at the BC Association of Aboriginal Friendship Center Centers. And in this campaign, uh, boys and men take a pledge to not be violent toward the girls and women in their lives. And they also pledge to keep one another accountable. Often communities, uh, it happens on a, on a local level. It's organized, not one big, uh, big campaign. But communities decide for themselves how they want to go about it. And they often draw on uh, local cultural practices for harvesting the moose and preparing the moose. And this draws on their local cultural teachings and the strength of their relationships with the land and the animals around them and their obligations to their ancestors. And as I started to talk to communities about these solutions that were happening on a local level, I started to think about law differently. Because I started to realize that these were not just cultural solutions or social solutions, but they were really the operation of a different kind of law, Indigenous law. And so what do I mean by Indigenous law? Don't we need courts to uphold our laws? Well, you can see on this map uh, that before we were turned um, all into First Nations people through the Indian Act, we were Kwagyoth and Haida, Nuchanuth, we were Skechison, Simshan, and Nishka, and within each individual uh, community that's represented on this map, these are just all the language groups in BC, each community had their own cultural practices, ceremonial practices, and laws that governed our lives for thousands of years and taught us about how to live with one another and to live in our relationships with the land and the animals around us. And so Canadian law came and created one law for everybody, as we know, and the Indian Act turned us all into status Indians. And it's these laws, the laws of Canada, uh, that are supposed to help us respond to violence in our communities now, but obviously it's failing. But underneath the laws of Canada, these indigenous laws are still alive and active in our relationships with the land, with one another. They've never gone away. And so as I started to think about the qualities of uh, Indigenous law, I could notice a different geography, one big 
law, one big solution, versus these local level networks of people working together to create change on a local level. And um, another quality of Indigenous law that many Indigenous uh, legal scholars have written about is this sense of, of power and agency that comes from working together, looking to yourselves and to each other, instead of looking to the police or some far-off authority for help. So what is agency? Well, we might think of agency as the capacity of a person to act in the world, or the ability to make choices for yourself. And agency is central to feeling like you matter, like you have some control over your own life. And in a lot of indigenous teachings, it's not just people who have agency, but the animals and the plants and the earth itself has agency, should have some sense, some say over uh, what happens to it. We need to listen to it for clues. Uh, and so underneath these laws of Canada, these networks, um, this agency is still alive in the relationships that we have with the land, with one another, and it has much to teach us about what strong relationships might look like in our lives. In my Kwagyoth uh, tradition, we have a teaching about raising one another up. We hold up our hands uh, when we speak and acknowledge our strengths, and we acknowledge our ancestors, we acknowledge one another. And I think we need to to look to that teaching, to look at how we can raise one another up, not just when it comes to violence, but lots of other issues in our communities. I wonder well, how we could have raised up women like Sheila Hunt before her name ended up on that banner. And in these, in these teachings, uh, these networks that were, uh, where we're responsible to one another, our relationships become law. If we think about law as kind of the rules that we use to define how we're going to live with one another in our communities, how we're going to go about creating rules to live with one another. It's our relationships, then, that hold us to account. We see uh, Indigenous cultural teachings often being put to work in, in big political actions, like Idle No More. We see people come together uh, to stand up for our forests and our salmon, and, and allies come together uh, in these big political actions. But I think we need to turn this attention to the smaller level of our everyday relationships with one another. Because I wonder who will show up when we ask people to stand up with us for our loved ones, to stand up for our very lives. So what can we take from all this? Well, first, instead of, instead of just looking to law uh, for answers to Canadian law, I think we need to look at ourselves, at strengthening our local relationships when it comes to, to answers to violence. The next time there's a story on the news about violence and we find ourselves kind of tuning out, we can question why that violence feels so far off from our reality. Because it's not. It's happening just around the corner to our neighbors. And so we can look at trying to lessen that distance between us. We can also look underneath the laws of Canada, look uh, underneath the cities that we see now, the teachings that are still alive in the communities uh, on these lands we live in. Sheila Hunt, I never did find out if she was my auntie because the point is she should have mattered whether she was my auntie or not. And the laws of this land tell me that Sheila should have mattered and been treated like a valuable member of society. And sh so should my cousin Malady and so should Dolan Badger. But my 15 years of working on violence tell me that it's not going to be stopped by a poster campaign or a court case or uh, any of the, those other legal solutions. It's only going to be stopped when the people who enact violence and the people who experience it, and those of us who witness it, are understood as being part of a network of people that are responsible to one another. We need to look to our neighbors, the people who live beside us, whether we know them or not. We need to hold one another up. Because if we don't, who will? Thank you. <laughs>